I want to talk about how Einstein abolished the ether, and I'll tell you what that means. Um, I'll also talk about how it came to be understood that when we look up at the stars at night, we're looking back in time. The light takes years to get here. I've often wondered how that affected astrologers who cast horoscopes. You know, I mean, <laughs> right now the stars are somewhere else. In 1598, the King of Spain offered a prize for solving the longitude problem. That's how far around the equator you've gone. Spain was losing too many ships, the, the Spanish Navy, from lost mariners, and the military value was obvious of knowing where you are. Galileo, who's shown here, showing his newly invented telescope to the Doge of Venice, had just invented the telescope. And with it, the first thing he did was to discover a moon of, Io, of Jupiter called Io. And it occurred to him that you could see Io disappearing behind Jupiter every 42 and a half hours. So the eclipses occurred every 42 and a half hours. You could watch them as you sail around the world and use them as a kind of global clock that could be seen from anywhere on Earth and give you the time back home. For him, that was Italy. Your local time you could get from the height of the sun. At noon, it was overhead. And as we all know from long-distance air travel, um, time differences between home and where you are give you your longitude. If it's a 12-hour time difference, you would be in New Zealand. Galileo didn't get the prize. When they tried it out on a ship, the ship rocked too much and they couldn't get a good sighting, but it worked perfectly on land and was used ever since for hundreds of years. Later, for example, to check Harrison's chronometer. At that time, Cassini was head of the Paris Observatory uh, and he wanted to check this idea so he asked his friend um, <coughs> Bartolin and his graduate student Ole Roma at the University of uh, Copenhagen, University of Denmark, uh, to travel to the island of Hven, which is in the straits between Denmark and Sweden, uh, to, to measure the longitude there of Tycho Brahe's old laboratory, which was still there and is there still as a museum. Brahe. I'm sorry, Brahe was dead by then. Ole Roma, uh, this young graduate, postgraduate student, went along with his telescope and his pendulum clock, and over months of observation, sighted the disappearance of the moon behind Jupiter every 42 and a half hours. But he found something very interesting, which led to one of the greatest papers in the history of physics. So, here's his paper. It was translated into English and published in Phil Trans in 1677. This is the sun, here's the earth going around it. Now, we zoom along at a fair clip here, it's 67,000 miles an hour, that's the speed of the earth around the sun. Here's Jupiter, and up here is Io orbiting like this. And if you're looking, say the earth is here, you see Io disappear behind Jupiter every 42 and a half hours. But what Roma noticed was that three months later, <clears throat> in different season, when the earth was down here somewhere, going on, zooming along at 67,000 miles an hour, the eclipses were a little late. And, of course, at that time, everyone thought the speed of light was instantaneous. And it occurred to this postgraduate student that this delay was due to the time it took light to catch up with the Earth. So while it was travelling toward the Earth, the light that you would see by looking up here as Io appeared, uh, <clears throat> the Earth had moved forward and the light had to travel further. The delay was about 10 minutes. Now, he very cleverly used this knowledge to make a prediction of a future uh, eclipse. Now, predicting the heavens at that time was you know, like magic. People really took notice if you could do that. His prediction came true, so of course they were, would burn him as a witch or something. But instead of that, they had a, appointed him to the Paris Academy. He gave a presentation on this, uh, and it caused a sensation. And this is his paper which resulted. From it, he could calculate the time it took light to travel from the Earth to the Sun. And he gave that number as about 11 minutes. Uh, uh, Newton, in his book, which is, came soon after, gives eight minutes, uh, which is remarkably close to the current 
It's a correct value. Light takes about eight minutes to get us to us from the sun, eight and a half minutes. So here's Romer in his uh, observatory that he built later on. Here's his telescope. Look at his pendulum clock. Here's the bob swinging backwards and forwards. He was very unlucky. Uh, he went on to do many great things. He became the mayor of Copenhagen. He was a judge. Uh, he invented the Fahrenheit temperature scale. But all of his work was destroyed in a fire in 728. His devoted supporter, Peter Horrebrow, managed to rescue one book. And by a remarkable uh, <coughs> situation, he had been working by a window at, at the uh, Copenhagen University. Uh, and he'd left one of his most important Nog books there. It sat there until 1920, <laughs> when somebody found this thing, and they were able to reconstruct a lot about the work he'd done. So this raised the question of what supports this light propagation through the vacuum. Uh, you know, waves on a river are supported by water. What is it in... If, if there's nothing out there in outer space, how can a wave get run through it? And, and this led to the idea, which the church, of course, forcefully supported, that there was an absolute frame of rest in the universe. They used to say it was the Earth. And Galileo, as you all know, famously denied that and narrowly escaped the rack as a result during his Inquisition. Um, but the scientists came to believe there was this stuff that filled the universe, sort of fixed to the most remote stars, bolted on to the distant stars, which was an absolute frame of God-given frame of rest. But if the universe is full of this sort of invisible rubber, uh, it, it has to have some pretty ridiculous qualities. We know that for all waves, their speed is given by the ratio uh, of their uh, stiffness to their density. So if you give this stuff the stiffness of steel, uh, it has to have a density much lighter than hydrogen, 50,000 times lighter than hydrogen, so that a wave would run through it at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. 186,000 miles per second. It also had to not impede the motion of the planets. Now, the planets are zipping all around the place. That's the Greek word for wanderer. Uh, and it had to uh, permeate all forms of matter and also be completely invisible. So this was absurd. But before you dismiss this as an ancient foolishness, we need to remember that James Clerk Maxwell got the correct equations of electrodynamics, the equations that describe all electrical phenomena, by using this model of the ether as a sort of vortex sponge, they called it, invisible rubber. Now, to get a speed from a time measurement, you need the distance that the light's gone. So they had to know the distance from the Earth to the sun and the Earth to the moon. This is a long, long story. I don't have time to go over it. Let me just say that the ancient Greeks had it all sorted out. This is a page, remarkable. It's a 10th century copy of the great Greek astronomer Aristarchus's work, uh, showing just how well they understood principles like parallax and geometry. Uh, and of course, they had all Euclid's theorems that we learned as kids in school. And their methods were terrific for measuring these distances. The problem was they couldn't measure small angles accurately, so their actual numbers for the distance from the Earth to the Moon were, were hopelessly out. Uh, but their methods were good. The one number they got right was the size of the Earth. The ancient Greeks knew that. You probably know they measured the length of shadow of a stick in two places, 2,000 miles apart, at the same time. And one of them, the sun was overhead, so there was no shadow. The other one, a couple of thousand miles away, had a shadow. If you know the height of the stick and the length of the shadow, you can get the size of the Earth. But accurate values came uh, only with the transit of Venus observations, 1761 and 16. These happened twice every century, roughly, about eight years apart. And um, I've shown here the kit which the Royal Society made up. This was the first truly international scientific collaboration. And uh, the, the Royal Society made up a kit of a tent with a clock in it, shown here, and a telescope. This is the one that Captain Cook, on his voyage to Australia, took with him and set up at Point Venus, the name it still holds today, for his observations. So a transit of Venus is shown here. This is a picture taken by a friend of mine with an ordinary camera when there was such a transit in 2012. This is Venus. So this is what's happening is Venus is closer to the sun than the Earth, and it passes across the disk of the sun, across a line from the Earth to the sun, twice every century. And if you make... Now, of course, they had no cameras. They would project 
as uh, Jeremiah Horrocks did uh, even earlier, in a dark room, the sun would come through one window, through a small pinhole, make a shadow image of the sun on the other wall, they'd draw it with a pencil and trace it. It takes about six hours for the Venus to move across the sun. And from those dimensions and angles, you can work out, if you know the size of the Earth, the distance from the Earth to the sun and the Earth to the moon. These, all kinds of misadventures occurred to these people. There was war, there was disease, there was famine. Uh, some of the observations, C Catherine the Great even sent Russian scientists to Mexico. But the answer they got was 93 million miles, which is within 1% of the correct answer. So back in 1671, 1761, from then on, we knew <coughs> the size of the solar system pretty accurately. Our next hero is greatly underrated, I think, because his work was so important for Einstein. This is Bradley, um, 1762, around the time of Newton. He basically lay on his back on a couch along here in his house. He built a telescope onto the wall of the chimney of his house, poking through the roof. He lay along here looking up at the star Gamma Draconis. And he measured the angle between the axis of the telescope and this plumb bob, the, the local vertical. So this is a string in a tube. On the end of it is a weight, and it's sitting in a bowl of water to stop the vibrations. He put a tube around the string to keep the dust out, and he writes that his biggest problem was the spiders, which used to get up in here and mess things up. So he lay here for several years, uh, all day, making notes and, <laughs> and measuring this angle. And he found that this star moved in a circle throughout. Of course, they took out the motion of the rotating Earth. That was understood. Against the background of fixed stars, he was moving in a circle. He didn't know why. Now, the answer is most easily understood. It came to him one day when he was sailing on the Thames, and he wrote a letter about this. Um, if you're walking along with an umbrella and it's raining, we can think of the rain as the starlight raining down. The faster you walk, the more you have to tilt the umbrella forward. Yeah? And it's the same situation with the starlight. You have to tilt the telescope, you have to look ahead of the star. Another way to think of it, perhaps simpler, is that because the Earth's whizzing along across the rain of starlight at 70,000 miles an hour, uh, photons coming into the telescope tube will hit the side of the tube. They will never get to your eye because of the sideways motion of the telescope. To event that, you have to tilt it forward. And his simple calculation showed that this tilt angle was just equal to the ratio of the speed of the Earth to the speed of light. So this is a fantastic experiment, extremely important and crucial for Einstein's theory of relativity. <clears throat> we move on now to uh, Fresnel. He was a, an absolutely brilliant mathematician and physicist. He actually worked in the roads to, uh, construction department, a civil engineer. During the, just soon after the French Revolution. Um, the thing he was most proud of, because he put it on his tomb, it's the only thing on his tomb, were the lighthouse lenses that he invented because they saved so many lives, these thick Fresnel lenses that he... But equally important for our story is that he came up with a theory of the ether drag. Now, I have to say that um, if we go back to this ridiculous properties of the ether. If you are on the Earth here with a flashlight and you shine it that way, now here's the Earth going along 70,000 miles per hour around the sun. Um, if the ethers bolted onto the most distant stars, the Earth would be rushing through it. And you'd expect a headwind. It's like waves on a river where there's a current. It's like waves on a river where there's a current. So. There'd be this, because we're moving through the ether, which is fixed to the most distant stars, you'd expect light going to go more slowly in this direction and the tailwind to speed it up going the other way. And it's fair to say that scientists looked for this effect for a couple of hundred years and was it, the absence of that effect, the absence of any headwind or tailwind, was something which really only Einstein was able to explain fully. So we have this measurement, and we now have Fresnel. Uh, his idea was that the ether is like some fog, let's say. 
as it gets close to the earth, it slows down and it's dragged around by the earth. The, the, the fog at the earth's surface is moving with the earth. Like the molecules whizzing over the wing of an aircraft. The, when you look out the window, the, the airstream actually at the wing is moving with the aeroplane and as you can move further away, it speeds up. But his wave theory was extremely important. His boss was a, a fascinating man, Arago, I think, who had the most interesting life of any of the people in my story. And Arago uh, suspected, he, Arago spoke good English, Fresnel didn't speak any uh, language other than French. Arago came to think that there was an Englishman, James Young, who might, might have scooped them <laughs> by showing that life was a wave earlier than they had. And so he writes home to his family when he's in London, uh, visiting Young. In 1816, now this is the time of soon after Jane Austen and, and the Napoleonic time and the French Revolution would be a fresh memory. In 1816, I went to England with my friend Gay Lussac to discuss Fresnel's work with Young. He told us that Fresnel's experience, experiments was already published in his own work in 1807. This did not appear to us correct and rendered the discussion long and minute, <laughs> as you can imagine. But look at this, this is fascinating. Mrs. Young was present, but did not appear to take any interest in this conversation. But as we know, that fear, uh, however puerile, of passing for learned ladies, of being designated a blue stocking, this is 1800, the blue stocking is that old, a blue stocking made the English ladies very reserved in the presence of strangers. Suddenly, Mrs. Young rose up and left the room and returned with the enormous quarto of Young's natural philosophy. She placed it on the table, that's her husband, she placed it on the table, opened it without saying a word, and pointed with her finger to a figure where the curved lines of diffracted bands were shown and on which the discussion turned and was theoretically established. So, Arago is saying, and I think this is true from um, Madame Dupin's diary, writing at the same time, that the French women really had much more authority and influence at the French court than did the English, were more liberated than the English women at the time. It was later found, understood that Fraga, uh, uh, Fresnel's ether drag theory did give the right answer, fortuitously, but for the wrong reason. Arago went on to do many amazing things. Uh, he wrote fabulous memoirs of all the French academicians. Uh, he went into politics and uh, abolished slavery in all the colonies and also flogging in the navy. Next we have Hippolyte Fizeau. Uh, he was a professor, we move now to the Paris Observatory. It's still there, part of it is a museum which still has his apparatus there. And these people made the first measurements of the speed of light on Earth, terrestrial measurements. And Fizeau did it with this toothed wheel. So he had a fabulous technician working for him, uh, Fremont, and he was able to use an ivory comb on a spinning wheel, so there were gaps between the teeth. And this would spin round at, uh, tw didn't have to go very fast, 12 revolutions per second, but there were 720 teeth. So light going up here would go through a gap in between the teeth. It traveled off over five miles across the chimneys and rooftops of Paris to a mirror he'd put on his father's house and was reflected back. But by the time it got back, the next tooth had come round and blocked it. So, he, because he could adjust the speed of his tooth wheel, so he had adjusted the speed until he didn't see any light, and then he knew that the time it took light to go 10 miles uh, on a round trip was equal to the time a tooth took to move around one place. Now, he got the speed of this thing with a piano, because um, this is, you know, 440 is an A, so you can, and it makes a whizzing sound, so you, if you've got your piano tuned, you can get the speed. His answer was that the speed of light is 3.4 by 10 to the 8th meters per second, and that's within 5% of the modern correct value. Working with him was uh, Leon Foucault. Now, Foucault, of course, is much more famous for his pendulum. The two of them worked together on many experiments in electricity uh, before one day they came across the works of uh, Charles... Wheatstone, who had measured the speed of electricity at King's College, his apparatus is still there. I went and saw it last summer in the basement. Uh, he tried, he'd measured the speed of electricity with a spinning mirror. And Foucault, who was not a mathematician at all, he was rather looked down on in the French Academy uh, because he wasn't a theoretician, but he was a better experimentalist, I think, than Fizeau and got actually a much more accurate answer. 
And his idea was to have a mirror here spinning. He had a friend who'd built the pipe organ, at, uh, just built the pipe organ for Notre Dame. And so this friend built him an air pump and he made it pneumatic. Up here is a thing, it's, probably, it's like a siren, or um, it's a spinning disc here that's blown around by this air here, turbine. And here's the mirror, which spins about the vertical axis across its diameter. So light from a source here, and they had a thing called a heliostat. They used sunlight coming in through the window. And they'd have a mirror, which rotated by clockwork, to keep the spot, focus spot of light in the same place throughout the day as the sun moved. Then that sunlight went up to this mirror out to here, now only 20 meters, not across the rooftops anymore. Uh, and by the time it came back, this fastly, rapidly rotating mirror had rotated slightly, so the image of the original source was displaced a bit to the side, because when the, by the time the light came back, the mirror had rotated slightly. And if he measured the distance between the original source image and uh, the source and its image, this displacement x here would increase with the speed of the mirror. And if you make a graph of the speed of the mirror against the displacement, you get the speed of light. His answer was within about half a percent of the modern value. Fabulous work. This is Foucault's pendulum. I put this up here so you can just remember this. It's very useful. These things are in many uh, buildings around the world now. We have one in my university in the physics department. So he put a huge pendulum up in the uh, Parthenon, I think it was, Pantheon, in Paris. It would swing across along this line here, but what happened was throughout the day, the plane in which it was swinging would appear to rotate. So if it swung along that line at noon, a few hours later it would be swinging across here, later across here. To understand it, imagine it's at the North Pole, and you give it a push to start it moving, and as Newton has taught us, it keeps on moving in the same direction, but the Earth rotates underneath it. So if you're standing here, its plane of swing appears to rotate. This was deeply shocking to the people of Paris when he set it up, and the, you know, the, the village folk would come in and say that it's magic, and again, he should be burned at the stake. But uh, that was the first direct evidence of the Earth's rotation. You could just see it with your own eyes. All of this happened just prior to the siege of Paris, the Paris Commune in 1870, a fascinating time when an extreme left-wing government got into power. And it's, a, it's just amazing to see how their policies map on to today's. So Elizabeth Warren, for example. What they wanted was uh, free child, child, child care. They wanted no gender discrimination. They wanted separation of church and state. All the issues which are hot-button issues now, were urgent issues for them then. Bismarck came with troops from Germany, bombarded the city, shelled it. There was more damage to the buildings of Paris at that time than in any other war before or since. And here's the menu. Uh, basically, Bismarck starved the population into submission. Uh, here's the menu at a restaurant at that time. You see their star starvation diet. They're living on dog cutlets, ragu of cat, donkey, fricassee of rats and mice. And this little note here says that only the brave American ambassador was the only person in foreign country to sit it out and remain in Paris throughout the siege. We now come to Faraday, of course, uh, who worked in this building. Here's a picture of the laboratory, and you can see this downstairs. Martin took me around before and I saw exactly this. Here he is working over in the corner here. Uh, his work is very important. It's in this li I'm leading up to Einstein's synthesis of all of this. It was crucially important because he founded field theory. So we imagine that the universe is filled with this invisible rubber, which supports light waves running through it at 186,000 miles per second. You know, light takes about an hour to get here from Saturn. Uh, Faraday was the first to see field lines, which he thought of as lines of tension in this ether. He took a magnet, a horseshoe magnet like this. I remember doing this as a kid. You put a card across the top, sprinkle iron filings on it, and they line up on these lines of tension. They're like rubber bands. Uh, now, you need, you need sideways forces, of course, also to keep them apart. Here's the North Pole, here's the South Pole. We're looking down on this thing. He could pump, put this in a jar, a glass bell jar, and pump out the air, and the lines were still there. So they were there in vacuum. What are they? 
what are these lines of tension in this non-existent ether? Uh, he wrote an extraordinary perceptive sentence in one of his letters to Maxwell. I consider radiation to be the high species of vibration in the lines of force which are known to connect particles and also masses of matter together. So he's there leading into field theory for gravity from electrostatics. Um, so he thought that there were lines of tension in this ether which were responsible for radiation. That's an incredible statement for su such an early time. That picture came out of Lodge's book in the 19th century. He discovered another effect which I saw before the talk, Martin showed me, the magneto-optical effect. This was just basically that when light goes through certain kinds of stuff, uh, if you put a magnet near it, it return, rotates the plane of polarization of the light. Now, why was that important? Because at that time, there was no connection whatsoever between electricity and light. It was Maxwell who explained all that. There was also no connection uh, until Maxwell between electric statics, that's when you get an electric shock in a hotel with rubber shoes on, and magnets. They thought they were completely separate things. So all of that was unified by Maxwell. So this was very important because he wrote a letter to Maxwell describing this, and it's the first experimental connection between light and electricity. Now, I guess you could say that sparks are that. I mean, they knew during a lightning storm that sparks gave off light. But other than that, uh, there wasn't much to connect them. That led Maxwell to a very famous uh, term in his equation called the displacement current. And the symmetry that that gave his equations was a crucial clue for Einstein in his theory of relativity. So we now come to Maxwell. Here he is with his dog and his wife. She was a tremendously religious lady. Uh, he grew up in a country school in Scotland. Here they are with their country Scots accents, firm religious convictions, social awkwardness, and James's dry, iconic wit. Uh, he was about uh, 40 years younger than Faraday, uh, but they did write to each other, and, and to some extent Maxwell's work is based on Faraday's experiments. He unified electricity, magnetism, and optics using a mechanical model of this ether. That's the extraordinary thing. He applied Newton's laws to this invisible rubber and got his four great equations. Now, in fact, he got 20 equations, which he put in his book and then promptly died soon after. And it was an extraordinary fellow called Heaviside, uh, an autodidact who lived with his mother in southern England um, and did nothing but study Maxwell's equations throughout his whole life and write papers about it. He was eventually recognized. And he reduced Maxwell's equations to the four that we teach our students today in electrical engineering and physics departments. He designed the old Cavendish lab, which is still there. He died of stomach cancer in 1879. Now, he never predicted radio. People say that he did, but he was focused on light. Uh, and it was, it was eight years after he died that Hertz discovered radio, and it was realized that his equations could be extended to radio waves that we use for our mobile phones. Radio waves are just light at a longer wavelength and lower frequency. And there's a nice story about them in this room uh, when uh, Maxwell had been giving a lecture on his kinetic theory of gases. Now, that's the theory about molecules bumping into each other in a crowded space. Uh, and the, apparently there was only one exit door, which is still the case, uh, and there was a bit of a crush and a bottleneck as people were leaving. And uh, Matt Faraday called out to Maxwell, Ho, Maxwell, can't you get out? If any man can find his way through a crowd, it should be you. <laughs> they sort of come alive when you see what they said. Well, they say that an equation is worth a thousand pictures, uh, so I've given Maxwell's equations here for what it's worth. But more important is this, the mysterious thing here. Really, we think of Maxwell as something of a magician uh, because his mechanical model of the ether is shown here. This is his diagram. He had to have these loop currents circulating to get magnetic coupling. Uh, and to get the coupling directions correct, like gear wheels, he had to put in these idler wheels. What on earth are they? They're vortices in this invisible rubber vortex foam stuff which just happens to the right properties so that it will uh, transmit a light wave. He, he had, uh, I'm sorry, um, he found that a change, by introducing these idler wheels, he, he could make his equation symmetrical so that a changing magnetic field caused an uh, electric field and vice versa. Um, and that produced a thing called his displacement current, which was his really original contribution to all of this. 
From that, he could work out the speed of light. Because, as I said before, we knew that the speed of a river wave or a or sound wave on a guitar string is the stiffness over the density. And he says in the happiest day of his life was he got this number. He was at his house up near Edinburgh. It's still there, the ruins of it at least. And he got this number when he worked out the speed for lights in the invisible rubber. And he thought he recognized it from somewhere. But he couldn't go home because of family obligations for a month. And he says it's the most frustrating month in his life because back in London he had Roma's value and Fizeau's value for the speed of light. He couldn't find it locally in the library in Edinburgh. So eventually he was able to get uh, a coach up to London and go to his flat in, in, here in London and look up his notes and found Fizeau's value was the same as his theoretically predicted value for the speed of light uh, if the vacuum is filled with invisible rubber <laughs> with these properties. <laughs> and he realized then that light was an electromagnetic wave and he had its speed. And that was one of the greatest discoveries in all of physics. So what I'm getting at here is just that these equations he came up with were a kind of metaphor. You see, if you ask what does the field consist of, we, we don't know, nobody knows. Physicists find equations which work. They don't know why they work, and they don't know the stuff that they actually represent. We don't know what is an electric field in a vacuum, because there's nothing there. It's a vacuum. By filling it with this metaphorical uh, invisible rubber, we get the right answer. It's a deeply mysterious process. Here's Maxwell. He died soon after the telephone had been invented. Uh, and he says here, we've all been conversing on the phone. His friend Garnet actually recognized the voice of a man who called by chance. But the phonograph will preserve for posterity the voices of our best singers and speakers. Uh, later, his, his biographer Campbell writes about him. He had a strong sense of humor, a keen relish for witty repartee, the outward sign being a particular twinkle of the eye. When working, he whistled a soft accompaniment to his inner thoughts. He could pursue his studies under distractions, such as loud conversation. Then he would take his dog into his confidence and say to the dog Toby, 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 it must be so. And then he'd join in the conversation. Maxwell played the guitar. He loved uh, Burns's poetry. He, and he wrote poetry, lots of it. And of course, he invented colour photography. His first colour photograph is in the Cavendish Museum in Cambridge. <coughs> and here they are around that time laying the first transatlantic cable. I put this in because this is really the birth of the web. So they tried to string a wire between America and England. Uh, the first one broke pretty soon afterwards, but eventually they got it. They could pick it up with a grappling hook. The, the bottom of the Atlantic is pretty soft sand, apart from this trench. Uh, and, and they could keep on going. Now, the way they did it was two ships met in mid-Atlantic. One, uh, each with this huge spool of cable on it. These sailors are spooling out, running out the cable over the side of the ship down to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, here's Kelvin explaining to the sailors around here why it doesn't all work with the speed of light. But they ships met in the middle, tied the ends of the rope, this, the cable together, electrical cable together, covered, covered with gutta percha, which they just discovered, and strung it out back to Newfoundland on one side and Ireland on the other. The driving force from the investors was share prices. You could get them earlier if this thing worked, instead of waiting 12 days for someone to sail across, and military and diplomatic information. So that's how they got their investors. And it was a constant struggle for money, of course. <clears throat> the first message from Queen Victoria to President Buchanan took 16 hours for 100 words. So it's five seconds per bit. Your mobile phone works at gigahertz rates. And now the last experimentalist I want to talk about before Einstein was Albert Michelson. He was of a Polish family. He was the first American to win the Nobel Prize. They settled in San Francisco. He tried to get a job with the president, Ulysses Grant, uh, and, and Grant eventually took him on and sent him to the Naval Academy from where he went on a scholarship to Helmholtz, the greatest German physicist at the time in Berlin. He simply decided to devote his entire life to pinning down and locating the ether, which everybody believed must be there, given by God. Uh, <clears throat> I would say all physicists born before 1900 believed in the ether, in its existence. 
So the great puzzle for him is why is there no headwind or tailwind due to the Earth's motion through the ether? What he found as a result of his life's work was that the speed of light is the same in every direction. And of course, for him, that was a great failure. He'd expected to find that light went faster when it was going in this uh, opposite direction, depending on whether the, the Earth's speed, how the Earth's speed was with respect to the, station, the distant stars. So here's his interferometer. It's a clever idea. It's entirely his original, own original invention, a Michelson interferometer. He sent a beam of light. Let's say the Earth is moving this way to the right, then this ether wind, the ether being stationary, would be to the left on the surface of the Earth. He sent a beam of light across the ether and back from a mirror and then into it and back on this mirror. And if you think of people swimming across rivers with a current, uh, you'll understand that the time it takes the light to go across it and back is different from the time to go into it and back. So where the two beams meet, he let them interfere, and by that you could tell how long they had the times for the two trips. So he expected there to be a change, you know, certainly six months later when the Earth was going in the opposite direction. It goes in a circle. Uh, and when he rotated his interferometer, it could be swung around about its vertical axis. But he got no result. He published it. Uh, he, I mean, he got no effect. There was no change in the time for light across or with the ether uh, th throughout the seasons of the year, as expected. Uh, so he wrote this paper. And you see, this was all sort of consistent with Fresnel's idea that the ether sticks, gets more sticky to the Earth as it gets closer to the Earth and is dragged around with it. He wrote a paper in which the conclusion was there, is no, there was no ether wind. The ether is not stationary with respect to the distant stars. Now, that paper, he thought, was a, 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 an indication of his failure as a scientist. Uh, he went back to America planning to give up science altogether. And he believed that nobody had read his paper at all. He got no response to it whatsoever. Well, it happened that he was seated at a dinner with Lord, the Lords Kelvin and Rayleigh in 1884. And they, in fact, had read it. They were fascinated by it. And Rayleigh, in particular, took a avuncular interest in this young American and wrote letters to him for the rest of his life. Uh, Michelson went and stayed with the Rayleighs in their grand ho house in the south of England. And the two of them urged him to try again. It's because it was so important, it's been described as the greatest negative result in the history of science. So he uh, <clears throat> took a job at Case Western and built a much better interferometer with his friend and colleague Morley. This whole great slab here is floating on mercury, liquid mercury. Uh, and he took measurements when this was rotated through 90 degrees, and he took it six months later and he got the same result, nothing. Um, so that, well, uh, perhaps just very quickly, I'll interject now before we start on how Einstein made sense of all of this. Um, I'll just say something about the discovery of radio because I became, in writing this book, I became a huge admirer of Heinrich Hertz. I think he was really the most gifted experimentalist of all of these people because the experiments he did were so difficult. He did them in Karlsruhe he discovered radio. He certainly didn't set out to do that. Now, it's interesting, when he did, they called it invisible light. You see, it was described perfectly by Maxwell's equations, just a different frequency. Maxwell never had the curiosity to ask, would his equations describe waves other than light at lower frequency, and all the way down up to x-rays and down to across the electromagnetic spectrum? Hertz was working also for Helmholtz, uh, and he started out with a slightly different aim. Now, what he, here's what he did. It was noticed sometimes that in lightning storms, you'd see sparks between the ions by the fireplace. Yeah? So the reason radio wasn't discovered, we have detectors for light, your eye, for example. There were no detectors for radio. That's why it wasn't discovered. But Hertz had the idea of using a spark gap as a detector. So here's what he did. He made a spark gap with a micrometer where you could screw down the gap as small as you like, and it was connected to a coil to give it a resonant frequency. In a completely darkened room, he had a machine in one corner making sparks with a little coil, and that would create, as we know, radio waves. He walked around in the dark, 
looking through an optical microscope at this micrometer gap, he would screw it down until it started to make a spark, and the gap length was then the strength of the electric field at that point, the lines that Faraday had seen running between his magnets. And he'd write that in his notebook. This went on for months and months, uh, years in fact. He was lucky because the wavelength just fitted into his room. Had he you know, worked at low, wound more, less turns on the coil, or more turns on the coil, the waves mightn't have fitted. Because they fitted into his room, a few meters, uh, I used to be a radio ham, so we, we built all these things in the 60s and 70s. So uh, he, would, he could create standing waves, in, like a guitar string note, across the room in this radio frequency field. And he was able to plot it out, and he noticed maxima and minima, just like a a standing wave on a, which a guitar string, where there's, you know, guitarists tune the instrument by running their finger up to a harmonic position where there's no displacement of the spring. And he was able to map out the standing waves, which he published. Now, that, so he had the wavelength from the number of turns on the coil, uh, Kelvin had published the frequency of that circuit. So the frequency was known, the wavelength was known, he could combine them and get the speed. And once again, the happiest day in his life was when he combined these numbers and got a number equal to the speed of light. He then knew that radio waves travel at the speed of light. And there's a wonderful letter in 1887. His wife, Elizabeth, drew the field lines for this work. That's the first plotting of elect electromagnetic field lines from a dipole ever, which turned out to be extremely important. But his wife wrote to his parents that Heinrich had again succeeded in the most beautiful experiments, which make him very happy and me as well, when he tells me about it with such a radiant face. Uh, I want to say something about uh, uh, spacecraft here, because I, I think it is just fantastic. You know, this thing, what happens, Cassini was the name, named after the head of the, <coughs> named after Roma's boss. <coughs> it was put up in 1997 and expected to last four years. It lasted 20 years. Here it is, this picture of Jupiter was, t uh, sorry, Saturn, was actually taken by this spaceship, which has then been photoshopped, a photo of the spacecraft has then been photoshopped onto this large picture of the planet. These are the rings, and in fact, Maxwell's first piece of serious physics was to calculate the motions of the rings of Saturn and explain why they all didn't just crash into the surface through gravity or get flung out into space why rings were stable, which he did, the tour de force. So what I want to emphasize here is just the amazing thing that the transmitter in this thing is 50 watts. Can you believe it? That's like the lamp in your refrigerator. It's a very weak bedside lamp. And yet, that 50 watts pointed towards Earth can send ones and zeros, like Morse codes, dots and dashes, back to an object a bit like a television antenna on the roof of a house at the Goldstone facility in the outer suburbs of Los Angeles, which are 700 million miles away, and the radio waves take an hour to get there. So we have to believe that these field lines that Faraday had seen between his magnet poles can stretch out, can reach out across the complete vacuum of outer space, and cause electrons in a wire, very slippery electrons, to slosh up and down on the antenna at Goldstone near Los Angeles and make a signal. Now it works, for, it's got several things going for it. First, this is directional, so it's a, it's a dish. But it's not a very good dish, very good, very, very directional. The beam that it sends out has a width of five million miles when it gets to Earth, much wider than the Earth, because you can't have a very big dish, it's too heavy. The one at Goldstone is 70 meters, I think it's a bit better. Secondly, they're transmitting and receiving on the same frequency, of course that helps a lot. But most important, they cool the receiver at Goldstone down to about zero temperature. And what that does is to quieten all the hiss and static that you normally hear when you tune a radio between stations. Okay, so the net effect of all this in 1900 was that things were in a complete mess. There are lots of papers with a million crazy theories. Some of the craziest were that um, <coughs> moving clocks slow down because if they're going very fast, and that moving objects get shorter in the direction of their length if they move very fast.
But no one had a coherent, unified exploration for all of this information. Here's a summary of what we've said so far. Maxwell's equations suggested an absolute reference frame. Maxwell's equations gave a speed of light. It didn't depend on the speed of the source. If you have a car coming towards you at night, shining its headlights at you, you would expect that if the car sped up, the light would speed up. It doesn't. No matter how fast the car is going, the light coming at you always comes at you at the same speed. There's no headwind, as we were saying. Unlike waves on a river, light speed did not seem to add to the ether current speed. Michelson's result was that there was no stationary ether fixed to the remote stars. That didn't help. Bradley's result was the opposite. Here's the point. If, if the ether was fixed to the... Oh, I mean, one explanation for Michelson's result, which he didn't really want to put in his paper, was that the ether is bolted onto the Earth. I mean, the church would have loved that. And that as the Earth rotated, it dragged this ether stuff throughout the entire universe around with it. Um, and if that were the case, that could not be true because if the ether was dragged around with the Earth, um, you wouldn't need to tilt your, your telescope in Bradley's experiment because the light waves would be bolted onto the ether. So the, the, Bradley's result was contradictory to Michelson's. There was good agreement with the Fresnel theory. Fizeau had done experiments running light through running water, water running anti-parallel to the light and, and measuring the speed of light as he sped up the water. And he got a change and it fit with um, Fresnel's theory. So people tended to think Fresnel's old theory of 1820 was probably right. And then the biggest problem of all was that Newton's laws uh, couldn't accept this idea about the speed of light being constant. Look, if you're on a beltway at the airport and you're walking along the beltway at two miles an hour and the belt's going at three miles an hour with respect to the ground, you're obviously walking at five miles an hour with respect to the ground, the sum of the belt and your own speed with respect to the belt. That's Newton's law. And it didn't fit with this results about the speed of light being constant, the car coming at you with its headlights on. So Kelvin gave a great talk in 1900. It was called Clouds Over 19th Century Physics, where he said the greatest unsolved problems... He basically said physics has solved all problems. There are only two outstanding small problems to worry about now. One is, uh, was called the ultraviolet catastrophe. That gave birth to quantum mechanics. And the other was the ether and in nature. And that gave birth to relativity, two of the great revolutions in physics. So there were three possible solutions. You could continue, as Michelson has devoted his life, to finding the ether. You could f assume that Maxwell had made a mistake and fixed Maxwell's equation. Or you could assume Newton made a mistake and fixed Newton's equations. Newton, of course, had immense authority. And it really did require tremendous boldness and confidence on the part of a 26-year-old patent attorney in Zurich, Albert Einstein, uh, to conclude that it was Newton who was wrong. N Einstein, as a patent attorney, he, didn't, he wasn't working at a university, had three portraits in his office, one of Newton, one of Faraday, <coughs> and uh, one of Maxwell. They were his heroes. So what to say about Einstein? Uh, I could summarise it by saying... Um, it slowly sunk into people that all motion is relative. Now, of course, Einstein became a great celebrity in the 20s, particularly because of work in general relativity. So clever students from Cambridge and Oxford, when they went to the railway station here in London, would ask the station master things like, does Oxford stop at this train? <laughs> so it was, pop it was in the air and written about in newspapers and so forth. Um, his paper of 1905 clarified everything at a stroke. He abolished the ether entirely. He assumed Maxwell's equations were correct. Uh, and he made changes to Newton's laws. And those changes led to the equation E equals mc squared. Now, E equals mc squared, his most famous equation, tells you the amount of energy E in a nuclear explosion when an amount of mass m is, disappears completely. And it's all a result of modifying Newton's laws so that all motion is relative and the speed of light is constant, to put it in simple terms. Um, <clears throat> so this equation, of course, is of profound importance. It tells us how the stars are powered. After all, a star is just a continuous succession of hydrogen bombs. Um, and it tells us uh, nuclear energy 
um, and it, well, many other things, of course. Um, his theory agreed with both Bradley and, Mac and Fresnel's results. Fresnel had got the right answer for the wrong reason. He came to America in 1921 where he was struck by the joyous, positive attitude to life of the people who he found to be friendly, self-confident, optimistic and without envy. He played the violin. He was once asked if he hadn't been a physicist, what would he have done with his life? He said, oh, I'd have been a musician. Uh, after playing with the Juilliard Quartet, someone went up to one of the musicians in the quartet and said, what was he like? What's he like as a violinist? And the, the musician said, Einstein, he's all right, but you've got no sense of time. In 1933, the Nazis uh, stole his sailboat. That was kind of the last straw. At that point, he moved to Princeton and stayed there till he died in 1955. But before that, he'd asked Churchill for help moving Jewish children out of Germany, uh, which Churchill did in response to Einstein's letter. And uh, my boss at Oxford, Sir Peter Hirsch, was one of those children. He said he was a deeply religious non-believer and very poignant words for our times now, without ethical culture, there is no salvation for humanity. So I'd want to put in here a plug for our own research because it seems so appropriate, but just by pure chance. One of the things, my main job in America is as director of science for a consortium, we got a big $50 million grant from the NSF for 10 years among seven universities, Stanford, Cornell, um, ASU, which is, which is by far the biggest, of them uh, and uh, others, Rice, um, UCSF. And it, we got the grant to use the X-ray laser, which was just invented in 2009, to try to make movies of molecular machines at work. These are the little molecular things going in your body all the time that uh, heal a wound, for example. Um, and this is one that uh, Professor Marius Schmidt's team led in a big collaboration in 2016. The, these are molecules, proteins, and they're the proteins in the material at the back of your eye. And, oh, this, it's the same protein here. It's called a cis-trans isomerization reaction. This across the top is the top view. These are frames of a movie stepping across, and this is a side view. And what we do is to flash some light, as you would uh, if light was coming into your eye, on this protein, and then a little later take an X-ray snapshot of it. And each delay between when we flash the light on it and when we take its snapshot gives us one frame of a movie. Yeah? And then we repeat that many times. It's like a stroboscope. And we build up a movie by changing the delay. And this is the result. And what happens is that this uh, molecule along the do dashed line here changes at this thick line from a left-handed conformation, left-handed shape, like your left handed, like your left hand, to a right-handed shape, because it's absorbed a photon of light. And when it changes from left to right, it sends a signal to your brain which says you've seen a flash of light. And that's how it works. So this is the photo detector in your eye. And this is a movie of it happening. But what is remarkable is the time scale. These X-ray lasers, there are now five of them around the world. In South Korea, there's one in Hamburg, and there's a British consortium to use that. And there's an important discussion now, if I can put in a plug, to build one of these in England, uh, which I've been a bit involved with. So, uh, you can get these movies of molecular machines in operation. Um, <clears throat> but the time resolution is the extraordinary thing. The time between this frame and this frame is about a millionth of a millionth of a second. So these are in femtoseconds down the bottom here. This is. Okay, so a millionth of a millionth of a second, because our X-ray pulse is so brief, we can get, we can resolve the motion of this uh, wriggling protein, and it just struck me that this is exactly relevant to something that Feynman said in 1950 when quantum electrodynamics, another branch of physics, was being established. He said that when an atom in the sun shakes, my eye electron shakes eight minutes later because of a direct interaction. That is truly remarkable. It's correct. Remember, Roma got 11 minutes for light to get from the sun to the earth. Newton put about, I think, eight or nine minutes in his book. How he came so close, I don't know. But this is what quantum electrodynamics tells us actually happens. A, a bit of light comes from the sun. Eight minutes later, you see it. 
Uh, it's interesting that, that Newton and Maxwell had opposite kinds of luck. Newton used his ideas about gravity uh, to predict the distance from the Earth to the Sun. <clears throat> when he looked up the best known value at that time, it was wildly different. So he gave up theoretical physics for 20 years. He, he was actually correct, but he thought it was all wrong because the experiment didn't fit. It, it, un, unfortunately for him, the, it was just a bad experiment. The numerical value that he looked up was, was hopeless. Maxwell had kind of the opposite luck. He uh, predicted the speed of light from his equations, and the value he chose agreed almost perfectly. Uh, and, but it, there were other values around, and he just happened to lock on to the right one. Okay, I'll finish up now. And uh, let me just sort of, in a more philosophical direction, speculate what, a, what is this ether thing? Of what stuff does an electric field consist? Now, the vacuum state in modern physics is thought to be alive with virtual particles and things and this vacuum energy thought to be responsible for the origin of the universe, the Big Bang. So you could say that modern QED just replaces the ether with another thing with a different name and you're just replacing one unknown with another. That would be pretty correct. Maxwell himself understood that mathematics is a metaphor in physics. He wrote, the analogy between light and vibrations of an elastic ether Although its importance and fruitfulness cannot be overestimated, we must recollect that it's based on a resemblance in form between the laws of light and the laws of vibrations. So he knew that these equations of his were metaphorical, but they worked. He didn't understand what was the underlying reality. Well, what is reality is a deep question. Of course, in quantum mechanics, what is real? Stephen Hawking, Hawking spoke once of a model-dependent reality and the idea that consciousness is nothing but the sum of all this sort of anticipatory modeling that our brain is doing all the time. And it leaves you with a fundamental question. Is reality out there waiting to be discovered or do we somehow impose our imagination on it to create it? That's what John von Neumann, one of the greatest mathematicians and physicists of the last century, believed. The speed of light, if we come back to that, I'm afraid to say it's no longer measured. In 1986, it was defined in terms of other cons known constants, so there's no point in uh, measuring it anymore. We know we've defined its value very precisely. And it's been fundamental to many things. The GPS, I think driverless cars, you know, if you didn't allow for relativistic corrections, they'd crash into each other. So, you know, it's important to get it right. You have to have the right number in there for the speed of light. But more interesting, I think, is the acceptance of Darwin's theory. You know, the, the reason they had, it was so difficult to accept Darwin's ideas in around 1900 was simply people couldn't imagine that the Earth was as old as it is. It's about four billion years old, and life's been around for more than three billion. They couldn't comprehend such times. And only after measuring the speed of light and using it for the redshift and the expansion of the universe can we scale, the, put a time scale on the universe and on the Earth. So scaling those times really aided acceptance of Darwin's theory. And I'll end with Eugene Wigner's famous essay on the unreasonable... It's, it's, physicists love talking, giving this quote in their talks. The unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. Uh, he wrote that the miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. We should be grateful for it and hope that it will remain valid in future research and that it will extend, for better or worse, for our pleasure, even though perhaps also to our bafflement, to wider branches of learning. So that's the end. Uh, this is a picture of Cassini's, the, I'm sorry, the Paris Observatory. It's still there, that building. I went and saw it last summer. Uh, when Cassini was boss and at the time that uh, Roma was measuring the speed of light from the moons of Jupiter. Um, and I hope you don't feel that, as Mark Twain said, the professor has cast great darkness on the subject. And if he continues, we shall soon know nothing at all. <laughs> Down the bottom are... Um, some of the topics I've left out, didn't have time for, which are all covered in the book. Um, but I think that the story of the measurement of the speed of light really is one of mankind's greatest intellectual adventures. I've tried to show the challenge it 
created for our most fundamental ideas about the foundations of science, space, and time in universe, and the inspiring ingenuity of the experimentalists who are part of this great adventure. And it does seem to me that the speed of light is the most important of our physical constants, appearing widely throughout science, and also providing a kind of unify playing a kind of unifying role in physics. Thank you. <laughs>